Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can identify some of the beliefs and thoughts behind the behaviors associated with antisocial personality disorder. So I'll answer this question by looking at 10 antisocial behaviors and the thoughts that cause them. Now I've done many videos like this, for example, the thoughts behind narcissistic behaviors, the thoughts behind borderline personality behaviors, and I've talked about how one popular conceptualization of how behavior originates is that stress or other environmental factors combine with beliefs, and this is what leads to the thoughts, and the thoughts lead to the behaviors. Cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, is really based, at least in part, on this principle. Now this idea applies to antisocial personality disorder, which I'll refer to as ASPD. But one of the interesting differences is that there's a lack of forethought associated with ASPD. That is, this disorder is associated with impulsivity. So sometimes people look at this particular disorder and say, we really can't think of the behavior as coming from distorted thinking because individuals with this disorder don't have the same thought processes as somebody with borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. They just do things without thinking at all. And we have some evidence that supports this theory in a way. Like you'll hear people with ASPD who have just committed an assault say, I just hit the person without thinking. I was feeling disrespected, or they looked at me a certain way. Often they say that they have no control. The behavior was automatic, or the temptation was irresistible. So again, there's this idea that there's no mediating thought process when working with ASPD. The person goes straight from the stressor to the behavior. Now, I can certainly appreciate this argument. There definitely seems to be a highly reactive component with ASPD, like being aggressive all of a sudden or being angry all of a sudden. But the reality is that we see this with all of the cluster B personality disorders. So not just antisocial, but borderline narcissistic and histrionic personality disorders. For example, one of the symptom criteria for BPD is intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. And another symptom is impulsivity in at least two areas that cause self-harm. Also, we know that it's not unusual for individuals with NPD to have moments of rage when their ego is threatened. So just because we see impulsivity, that doesn't really change the way we conceptualize how stress, beliefs, and thoughts relate to one another. The cycle might be sped up a bit if somebody's highly reactive, but the structure of the cycle is still the same. So I'm going to go through the list of 10 behaviors and then list the thoughts that somebody with ASPD might have right before they engage in the behavior or as they're engaging in the behavior. For comparison, for each of the behaviors, I'll also discuss a thought from another personality construct. For example, paranoid, borderline, or avoidant personality disorders. This will provide an idea of how the cognition patterns might be different when looking at other types of personality pathology. So I'm offering a conceptualization here, a theory about what could be happening. What's actually happening in any particular case could be quite different. As I go through the list of behaviors, I will alternate between using a man and a woman in the example as the person with ASPD. So let's get started with behavior number one. We see a man commits a crime that he evidently was going to get away with, but then he brags to his friends, giving them details of that crime. This is actually fairly common with ASPD. So looking at the thoughts behind this, this will make my friends fear me. So we see kind of an element here where the man is trying to get respect and be feared among his peers. Next thought, I enjoy reliving criminal behavior. So sometimes just by talking about the crime again, the individual gets some sort of satisfaction. He can relive a moment of that and kind of connect with his original motivations for committing the crime in the first place. The last thought, I have no chance of getting caught. I've seen this quite a few times. The individual believes there's really no possibility that they could get caught for their crime. They never even really consider that component. It never enters into the equation. Now taking a look at the same behavior from the point of view of narcissistic personality disorder, I want people to admire me. So this is a little different, but it's worth noting that NPD and ASPD are highly comorbid. So if somebody has one of those disorders, it's not unusual 
that they would have the other. Moving to behavior number two, a woman catches another woman with her boyfriend and attacks her with whatever she has at hand. So she just picks up an object and assaults the other woman. The thoughts here, if I let the romantic rival get away with this, she will try to take more from me later. So this really connects back to the idea of respect and dominance through force, as opposed to using finesse. The second thought, I wanted to hurt this person anyway, and this gives me a reason, right? So sometimes individuals with this disorder are aggressive. That's actually one of the symptom criteria. So they want to be in combative situations. So if somebody gives them a reason, they might be all too happy to engage in that level of violence. The last thought here, attacking people is exciting. So this is kind of similar to the second thought. This is tied in with high sensation seeking, which we know is associated with ASPD. Now moving over to borderline personality pathology with the same behavior. I need to attack this romantic rival to preserve my romantic relationship. So we see a fear of abandonment here. Behavior number three, a man is arrested for stealing a car. The thoughts here, the problem with the situation is that I got caught, right? So we see a lack of insight here. The problem is getting caught, not committing the crime in the first place, right? There's really no remorse about that. There's no worry about actually committing the crime. They're not worried about depriving somebody of the use of their car. They're upset at themselves for getting caught. Next thought, next time I steal a car, I'll be more careful, right? So we see no plans for changing. Again, a lack of remorse. The last thought, I can talk my way out of this when I get to court. I think this is common because individuals with this disorder tend to believe in their reasons for committing the crime in the first place. And they think that other people will connect with those reasons as well. It's like the idea other people must think like I think. They can't appreciate that there are differences and that their thinking may be outside of what's normal. So this same behavior, stealing a car from a paranoid personality perspective, I took the car so that I can search for evidence that the owner was spying on me. So again, we see a much different motivation as we move from one personality disorder to another. Behavior number four, a woman is kicked out of a shelter for not following the no smoking rule. So she smokes when she should not have, and they remove her from the shelter. The thoughts here, unfair rules don't have to be followed. So we see a disregard for society's norms. Second thought, the people in the shelter don't understand that I wanted to smoke, right? So we see a lack of insight here. People should be making exceptions for her. That's how she thinks about it. She doesn't understand that other people don't necessarily care about how she feels. The last thought, I can't believe they caught me, right? So again, we see this mentality. Somebody really believes that they can't get caught. They're not even factoring that in to the equation. Looking at this same situation from a borderline personality perspective, if I didn't smoke, I would lose control of my feelings. So the individual realizes that when they lose control of their feelings, other people don't like that. And they believe that justifies breaking whatever rule they choose to break. Moving to item number five, behavior number five. A man is given a longer prison sentence for assault because he would not show remorse. The first thought, nobody ever cared for me, so why should I care about anybody else? So this is really the sense of being a lone warrior in a hostile world. And this is really general defiance, right? So again, no one ever cared for me. Why should I care about anybody? Now, if we move to the second thought, we see a more specific level of defiance. I've been attacked plenty of times and nobody's ever apologized to me. When my attackers apologize to me, I'll apologize to this victim. So we see it's kind of similar to the first one, but again, more specific. The last thought, the victim deserved to be attacked. So this is just attributable to a lack of insight, which is very common with the SPD. Moving over to narcissistic personality disorder. Again, the same behavior, no remorse. The victim should apologize to me. I've actually heard this many times. This is wrapped in with the sense of entitlement we see with narcissism. Behavior number six, a woman attempts to manipulate a man who has correctly identified her personality features. So he's on to her, but she still wants to try with the manipulation. The thoughts here, I can easily fool this person, right? So no recognition that that man is aware of her traits. She still believes she can 
move forward and manipulate him quite easily. The second thought, this person distrusts me because somebody else warned them about me. So she's seeking to blame somebody else. She can't admit that her manipulation skills are not always effective. She believes they're perfect. The last thought, if manipulation doesn't work, I can always get aggressive. So we see the woman is pushing to get what she wants, regardless of the risk for others. So with antisocial personality disorder, often people with this disorder view themselves as having different options on this continuum of aggression. They can simply get more aggressive until they get their way. Looking at the same manipulation example from the point of view of histrionic personality. When this man told me about my characteristics, he only proved he was attracted to me. So we see with this disorder, somebody assuming that relationships are more intimate than they actually are. Moving to behavior number seven, a son repeatedly lies to his parents and eventually alienates them because of that behavior. The thoughts here, the truth is what you make it, right? I've heard this many times working with cluster B personality pathology and other types of personality traits. We see no respect for the concept of truthfulness and a strong belief in their talent for deception. The next thought, the truth is irrelevant. So this acknowledges the concept of truthfulness, but the individual can't see how that relates to them. So truthfulness is an abstract, kind of foreign, distant concept that doesn't really affect them. The last thought, everybody lies, so what's the problem? So again, kind of seeing the world as a cold, hostile place where everybody's just trying to get what they can from other people. Now, looking at this behavior from the point of view of narcissistic personality disorder, I have to lie to people, otherwise it will take them too long to understand how great I am. Moving to behavior number eight, we see a woman stops talking to her brother one day, kind of all of a sudden, and then never talks to him again. So a sudden rejection of a sibling. The thoughts here, I ask him for money and he wouldn't give me any, so I have no more use for him. The next thought, this relationship was getting boring. So again, we see the sensation seeking component here. The last thought, I'll talk to him again if I ever need him. So we see a failure to understand how relationships actually work, and we see a failure to consider long-term consequences. Looking at this from the point of view of paranoid personality pathology, my brother committed some offense against me, and I'll never forgive him. So we see someone who's willing to hold a grudge for a long time, if not for the rest of their life. Behavior number nine, a man gets a large sum of money, for example, an inheritance or proceeds from a lawsuit and he starts spending it recklessly. The thoughts here, I can easily double this if I take it to a casino. This one's pretty common. Next thought, now I can finally have some fun. Even though with the personality we see with ASPD, having fun is something they attempt to do regularly, right? There's not a lot of sacrifice. There's not a lot of delayed gratification. Yet still, when they come into some money, they believe now is the time for fun. They kind of forget what they've been doing up to that point. The last thought, if I didn't spend it quickly, it would disappear anyway. So really just justifying the behavior. And of course, we see poor money management skills. This situation from the point of view of borderline personality pathology, if I buy a lot of stuff for myself, it'll take away from the feeling of emptiness. We know a chronic feeling of emptiness is a key symptom with borderline personality disorder. Now moving to the last item, behavior number 10, a daughter is asked by her parents to find work and stop sitting around the house all day. The first thought, that's not fair. You never made my brother get a job. So we see this appeal to fairness and really trying to dodge the whole issue. The next thought, am I supposed to work all day for a few dollars? Right? So this kind of attitude of I'm too good to work. The last thought, my big break is coming and I'll make a lot of money when that happens. So we see an unrealistic evaluation of her own abilities, and also just this belief that someday, perhaps magically or randomly, somebody will discover her and give her a lot of money for an undisclosed or unknown talent, right? It's not really clear what the skill is or what the person's going to contribute, but they believe that someday things will go their way. Highly unrealistic. We also see not wanting to put the work in, but still wanting the reward, right? So again, no delayed gratification, no long-term planning. Those things just aren't 
very common with an individual with ASPD. Now, looking at this from the perspective of avoidant personality disorder, I will work as soon as I can find a job where I don't have to be around people. This is fairly common with avoidant personality disorder. It's also common with schizoid personality disorder. So really, either one of those personality disorders might have this particular thought featured. This idea of just trying to find a job where someone can be isolated. So those are 10 behaviors linked to antisocial personality disorder and some thoughts that are behind them. I know whenever I talk about disorders like antisocial personality disorder, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.